so good afternoon good evening because my, our participant are attending from across the globe some are registered from bahrain some are from other gcc country from india we have a registration from even from uk so in some places good morning good good afternoon good evening and salam alaikum to my uh, arabic friends and uh, so today we are starting this uh, webinar it is on industry university interface how industry and university can work together and how teaching learning and collaborative research can be improved so we have distinguished panelists there are six panelists with this seminar and these panelists are really really very very big name in the industry they are they are industry leader they are torch bearer to the industry many of them have a global experience variety from they are they are working from different variety of the field accounting finance risk management banking manufacturing consultancy internal audit operations so they have a variety of experience and everyone has 20 25 year plus experience so uh, i first want to help uh, first want to welcome uh, everyone all the panelists and i want to thank professor abdullah and professor mansoor uh, to arrange this webinar to give full support for this event and now the we have to work on the theme and this theme is university industry interface so now i first welcome professor abdullah to give some welcome speech then it will be followed by professor mansoor then i will again go to the next proceeding professor abdullah uh, thank you very much bismillah arrahman rahim uh, i would like to of course uh, thank every one of you really it's very very uh, i'm very pleased to be a part of this uh, forum uh i'm really i think uh, dr gagan for arranging this uh, very important forum uh i think uh, of course all our panelists the guests who accepted to be uh, part of this very important forum and as you know you know uh we have been in education probably using the classical face to face education for the last probably 200 to 300 years we do improve there is a lot of improvement but we have never been faced with a challenge like what we have now so after this uh, pandemic the corona 19 education certainly will be different teaching after corona will be certainly different than teaching before corona i am very very uh, yani happy that we have not been taken by great surprise by surprise certainly but wasn't a big surprise because the infrastructure of bahrain was ready really and i mean by the infrastructure mainly the ict sectors and i am very very pleased that bahrain according to the united nations statistics are number 12 or 13 from the setup in infrastructures so that really gave us in the university an advantage over many other countries who did not invest in that way so it shows that bahrain were very lucky and for the difference all the time our uh investment went in the proper in that aspect and so when the things came and we were requested to change from face to face teaching to uh online teaching virtual teaching whatever we call it with all the different microsoft teams zooms uh moodle and all we've done very well we were able to change within 24 hours and that's really 
a great things for Ahliya University and for m many other universities. But we have a very big problem still remains. The practical side, the connection with the industry, and that's why I think uh, in this uh, the great panelist where you are the industry, we would like you to tell us from your side what should what we should change, what will you anticipate from the graduates or the intern, what to do. And I'm really happy to have you all and to listen to your advice because based on your advice, Ahliya University and mainly Bahrain will follow. It. And I'm very, very happy to tell you this morning when I was talking to uh, in the, the World Network, I've mentioned that and next week the president of Ahliya University is going to give to the network the experience of Ahliya University for all the world to tell them you know, what did Ahliya University do? And we are really pleased to tell you this picture. I don't want to take longer. Thank you very much. I am very eager to listen to you and to hear your advice. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Abdullah, for your welcoming speech. And now uh, I am giving the floor to Professor Mansoor to welcome our guest and say a few words. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gagan. I think really this is a privilege to be uh, watching uh, such, uh, I would call the stars and leaders of Bahrain industry and commerce. This is really a privilege for Ahliya and we highly appreciate you taking from your very busy schedules to come and talk to us and talk to our students. We really appreciate it. I really high have, I have high hopes that this particular panel will shed lights on very strategic issues. Uh, issues, you know, I'll just give you an example. I have been looking at research published in leading journals over the last year, looking at papers, how to collaborate, how, how do you set up collaboration and cooperation between universities and industry. And I've looked at many models across the world and we're trying to implement some of these ideas here in Bahrain. There is some resistance and I think, you know, the issues of internships, the issues that our students doing master dissertations, searching for ideas to do research for free for industry. And we need to find ways of how uh, every year about 100 master dissertations I don't want to say that they go to waste, but I think we can put them to action to save Bahrain and the world. So <clears throat> all these challenges exist with all these uh, industries and commerce, and we want to utilize that. And I, I think also, you know, uh, your contribution will somehow uh, contribute to ha having better employability skills, uh, better communication skills, better, pr better practical skills. You know, there, there are many things you can say to our students, and this is why we are recording this and it's going to be projected live and it will be used. And I think we will show what you say. I think this is probably Dr. Gagan can take this. This particular session we will make sure that our students class by class listen to it, especially those in the final year to realize how you think you are a strategist. You are decision makers. You are out there leading industry and and, and commerce. So I think there is a lot to do. I, I really want to thank all of you. I, I mean, I want to thank Mr. Jamal Fakhro, Mr. Ali Al-Baqali, Mr. Irvin, Mr. Dean Brown, Mr. Abbas, and Mr. Robert Brown for your presence. I don't want to take too much of your time, but I, you're welcome and thank you and we'll be listening. All the best. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Mansoor, for well, this your welcoming welcoming speech. And uh, I noted down this uh, this fact that we will display, we will show the same recorded session in our classes through Microsoft Teams. And I will talk to my all colleagues, and definitely we will show this conversation to our colleagues so that our colleagues and students so that our student and colleagues they will fine tune their skills and their approach 
in new scenario post covid 19 during during covid 19 and definitely we will incorporate the the suggestions advice and recommendation by our distinguished panelist so thank you very much so now we are going to uh, introduce first our panelist we have six eminent pa panelists in this webinar and i'm starting with mr uh, jamal fakru his excellency jamal fakru is managing partner in kpmg and he is also holding a very very senior position in government as well and he is first vice president in shura council and he is also shura council mem member of course and he is uh, i think the most most senior uh, audit professional in this country because kpmg is working in bahrain from last uh, around 60 years what i remember correctly because i attended their events and i remember this and we have the second and uh, mr jamal fakru he is a, a cpa from america and now we have the second panelist mr ali bakali mr ali bakali is a cfo in uh, aluminium bahrain elba it is the second most biggest largest uh, aluminum aluminium company uh, in the world so he is heading that uh, manufacturing unit so maybe we can get some insight from him from the manufacturing sector then we have the third panelist third speaker we have mr arvind benani he is a very very senior chartered accountant he worked in big four and now he is heading productivity middle east and possibly he is managing the team of around 1500 people or 2000 people and now we have the third speaker we have the third speaker mr dean rowan he is not a new new person in this risk management fraternity he is a very very famous risk management professionals very very uh, prolific speaker we listen him in many many workshops conferences and by chance we have a privilege that he is our external advisory board member as well and right now he is heading the board training division of Ernst and Young and we have the fourth speaker panelist Mr. Abbas Radhi. Mr. Abbas Radhi is a, a managing partner in Avil accounting and accounting and audit firm and he is also holding the position of chairman of Bahrain Accounting Association and he is a very very senior chartered accountant in this Bahrain and GCC community and we have the last but not least Mr. Robert Brown he is uh, holding very very senior position he is a partner in Becker Tilly and he is uh, leading the advisory practice in kingdom of saudi arabia he he is joining from saudi arabia and he worked in big four in a very very senior positions he has almost 30 35 35 year experience in audit accounting and consulting so now we have the six panelists and now uh, I, I i want to give uh, each panelist approximately three to four minute and they can speak about our uh, a webinar theme that how our university can work more closely with the industry, how we can inculcate new skills in our graduates, how we can encourage our students to acquire the skills which is needed by the industry. There should not be skill gap. Always there is a, a claim by the industry, there is a skill gap. We cannot really fill 100% gap, but we can minimize the gap and during this COVID-19 scenario, things are changing very, very fast, drastically, paradigm shift in education, <laughs> paradigm shift in industry. So whatever was normal earlier, it is now becoming very, very extraordinary. So we are working from home, working, studying from home. So these are the new reality. So technology is also playing very important role. So possibly our industry expert, they can highlight how this technology can be used 
in for the betterment of society betterment of education betterment of employability of the graduates and how industry can be benefited by by this whole exercise so uh, now we have new technologies like artificial intelligence fintech new stuff is coming virtual reality so how this kind of uh, um, technology or some other new technology which i missed can be incorporated or they can guide us how we can work more closely so that we can have less less expectation gap between industry and university so i am inviting first uh, his excellency mr jamal fakhru to say few words about about this idea can i just yes. for but just a small correction uh, yes. mr ali fagali is the ceo of alwa is not not CF, cfo so uh, just uh, you know okay a correction it is i am sorry i am sorry it is it is my fault i think now he is ceo but by chance i know him from many years earlier yeah. couple of years back 7 8 years back he was cfo i'm sorry so mr ali bakali is a ceo of alba and alba is second largest aluminum company in the world so thank you so thank you very much mr jamal you can start now uh, thank you dr gaga and uh, dr abdullah dr mansour thank you very much for your invitation uh, i'm delighted uh, to to participate with you today really to uh, to listen to my colleagues and my friends on the on this um, on this webinar again to learn and to understand from them because as you know we are all still in the in the learning curve of the impact of the of the covid-19 on our businesses our culture our behaviors and and so on uh, i will not be able uh, i don't think i or maybe many of us can really tell you what exactly is going to happen uh, uh, once we once we overcome the the pandemic uh, issue but definitely there are there are number of uh, of uh, of a clear messages we are getting as that life will will be definitely different before and after covid uh, the the you want us to concentrate on on uh, universities and, and industry uh, going forward and interface I do believe that uh, you guys will continue to play a major, major role in, in, uh, in helping us in doing our businesses. I mean, I can, I can openly and, and clearly uh, say that you guys have been feeding our business with your students in, uh, in accountancy and in business administration. They have been great guys, have been great, great helpful to us in our industry. Uh, and this need to, need to continue. Now, what would the industry what what would the industry require? I think I think the, the industry would require uh, more people who who, are, who who understand or can can work with with, with technology more than 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 working uh, behind 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 their desks. So the one for the, the one focus I think we would need to do is, is focus on technology, how you bring technology into the life of your students, uh, how you can how you can help them for uh, how you can help them to settle in their jobs going forward. I mean, today we hear that number of professions might might disappear, but uh, but technology will replace them. But still, you would need an accountant to develop an accountant uh, 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 software. You would need an engineer to develop an engineering software, and so on. So the base is there, but you would need also people who can und who understand technology and digitalization more than 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 the past. The the going forward. Digitalization is the name of the game. We need to train our people how to work in a digitalized uh, environment. We need to develop them to understand even coding, which used to be which used to be something very specialized 30, 40 years ago. I know that my grandsons today are studying coding in their school. So we are talking about basics that that everybody needs to understand. Uh, so technology, technology utilization are, are major for us going forward. The one other thing I believe you at the university need to do 
as to 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 uh, teach the students how they can how they can change their behaviors uh, from sitting in a classroom to sitting at home or a coffee shop or a library behind a screen and listen to their professors. The same thing they would need to learn how they could work at home and not going to office. What would that mean to them? You know, today, unfortunately, uh, we we assess we assess uh, our people when they come on time and leave on time. Tomorrow, this will not work. Yes, you can do it online. At what time they 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 click on and they uh, get off? But what they need to do really, and we, we what we need to do is to to assess our people on their productivity. That is a big change from the way the way we are assessing people. Is it really from attendance or productive or or from productivity? And uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Mansour mentioned one single word, intention. And I will tell you one thing. I have been sitting with my team, with my HR team for the last 10 days now, discussing how we can continue our internship program without having the people coming to our offices or go to our client offices. And I can tell you until today, we could not find a solution. And I would really appreciate if anybody on this call could share with me any experience how we can run our internship program. And as you know, Dr. Dr. Gaga and Abdullah, we have between 80 to 90 interns every year in KPMG. And we know we know how much your students need to do the internship to get their qualification and their, their certification. So we want to help you with that. But unfortunately, you know, you know, in turn, they require somebody to hold their hands and so on. So really, that is that is one of the issues where uh, where where uh, where we need we need to to work together on how this could have, could work. Uh, as I said, work ethics and work from home is something going to be totally new. Okay, and I think I think we as business leaders here need to be very much open minded. We need to be very much helpful to our to our to our staff. We need to encourage them to really work from home and to, we need to 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 build confidence in them and for them to, to build confidence in us. We don't we need to ensure that our people are trustful people and they are delivering their work, whether they are in the, in the, in the classroom or an office. This is the change of culture which we need to do. Is it easy? I can tell you no. It, need, it, it would require a leader who believe in that change. And that leader could start from university. You guys need to change the mindset of your students who will come to the market on how they could, could really deliver their work from home, from, from, from public places, from wherever it is. The other bit really is, I will tell you, I mean, I mean, working from home, I mean, we, we started this program five, six years ago, and we used to have long list of authorization for, 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 for staff to work from home. When we had the, 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 the pandemic, we deleted all those requirements and said, people, we trust you, you go and work from your house. Okay, now this requires, as I said, two sides, the leaders to do that and the staff to understand that. In the old days, we used to give our staff car allowances, car park allowances. I can tell you going forward, we'll be giving our staff internet allowances because they will use their offices. Some of them will say, OK, I'm not coming to the office. Help me with my desk. These are the sort of things and we need to be open with that. So there are simple changes. But we need as leaders to make the life of our people as simple as possible for them to contribute and to participate. I don't want to tell you, Abdullah, how much this, this will bring business to you guys, because in the old days, the students have to come to university. You have to have a campus and so on. And here, really, I'm serious about this, Abdullah. Do you really need to invest your 20 million dinars in a new campus in, the, in, the, in, in, in Salman City? Or really, you don't need to do that going forward. You need to change the mindset of the of the of the higher education uh, uh, council that 
going forward, do we really need need this space or not? Running businesses again, do we really need to have large offices or not? But with all with, with saying all of that, we need to think seriously of how we can bring people together. Now we are talking about social distancing. I think going forward, we need to uh, to to ensure how we can bring our people to be together. We are a, we are a human beings. We need to be next to each other, working with each other, and therefore, yes, we'll ask people to stay at home, but then how we can, how we can bring them together, being human beings. I will stop here to give uh, others uh, time to uh, to participate, but but I'll be available to, to answer any question. Dr. Uh, thank you very much, His Excellency, Mr. Jamal Fakhru. Uh, your recommendation will be definitely noted, and we understand that self motivation among employees among student is must in this new scenario during this covid 19 we realize that online teaching is slightly difficult it is a challenging task because in the other side student is sleeping listening not attending uh, attending it's difficult to really chase the students so and the same thing same thing you will you are also facing as an employer you are not sure whether your employee is working from home or he is just at home so these are really practical challenges so definitely we will deliberate and we will try to brainstorm to resolve your internship opportunity in this forum as well so we will try to figure out some solution for that as well so now i am inviting mr ali uh, Al Bakali, CEO of Alba, to share his thought that how the biggest uh, biggest aluminium company is embracing the changes in COVID-19 scenario. How they change the work work culture, work style, or how they address this issue in their company. So, Mr. Bakali, uh, its floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, thank you all for giving me this opportunity to to participate in this important uh, topics. Actually, uh, Mr. Jamal almost he covered most of the soft area parts, but I'm going to to give my insight information from the manufacturer side. Really, uh, as a manufacturing, you should expect unexpected. Yani, uh, for the last many years we have our own contingency plan we have our own procedures how to face any challenges or to face any crisis but this covid 19 really it was uh, it was a new things for us nobody planned for it uh, it was a new at the beginning we 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 were on the sh uh, shock uh, uh, phase which panicking everybody but Gradually, we are learning with, with the time, and now still we are in the learning curve, as Mr. Jamal said. We are still learning from the situations. We are still learning from the people who we are engaging with them. Really, as a manufacturer, it's not like an, uh, an uh, like a company like uh, giving a, a services like all the paperwork. We are we need people at site to work. We need people to to operate, to to drive the equipment, to drive these all machineries, and it's not easy to balance this manpower. Especially, you know that if someone infected, you have to isolate and quarantine the full team. Then, what is the contingency plan for the company to do? We have to change the shift. We have to change people. We have to inject more contractors also as a plan B. From beginning, actually, we 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 had a lot of uh, issues, but with the time, as I said, and yani everybody uh, think differently, we start giving the people to work remotely from uh, from home. But this is only for offices job, like the accounts department, like marketing department, like uh, HR, and 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 the procurement or supply chain. But the big challenge we face actually for the last few months how to sustain our operations because because our business is to produce aluminium uh, it was not an easy 
uh, really uh, we have to accommodate some contractors also what action plan we did. We are sanitizing all the facilities inside the Alba. We stop uh, servicing the, the canteen uh, services, which means everybody has to get his his meal and eat in his office for the office people. For certain time, this is like a panicking situation. Later on, we managed to have the small amenities for certain people to to consider the social distancing in order to to uh, prevent or to accommodate the the spread of uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, in terms of a production, we are not impacted at all because we have the uh, we activate our contingency plan in terms of of the operations. But this also this uh, crisis it's open mind for for us as a leaders also. We discover that not necessary to to make to to be like a police guy and to question the employee for every five minutes or ten minutes he is late from work. We discovered that many position we can we can uh, sorry to say, but we can outsource them. Actually, it is not a core business for us. Why we have to keep them? This is a new eyes or a new things for us in terms of a training. Actually, because our aim or our objective in the company not to stop safety uh, awareness, nor the training for our employees in terms of safety. We are really minimizing our present as a management to the shop floors. But once we present, we are taking all the precautions like wearing masks, gloves and so on. For the training, actually, we were thinking how we can encourage people to participate and to, to have more training people. We did virtual training actually and and uh, we did actually for the last uh, two months. We did two uh, inside Alba. And the outcome actually was very, very successful. We are not limited with the space. As Mr. Jamal said, we have to think about the space. In the past, when we are going conducting any training, we have to be worried about the space. It's accommodate only 20 or 25 if it is a big hole, maximum 50. But now with this new technology, by having the teams or by having a Zoom uh, conference, uh, it, it, it allow you to have unlimited people to participate. The education or the awareness will be giving to everybody without any limitations. Actually, we 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 done two, and we are in planning also to do uh, more in, in in the coming uh, weeks. But this it, it showed that even for a company, we cannot do uh, a physical training. Now we have to think differently how we can cover this part. Just uh, uh, I have my son. My son is having the VR, the virtual reality games. I was just looking at him. I said, why we should not yani, customize or, or use the idea of uh, virtual reality games to use it inside the, the plant, how to repair the equipment, how to repair uh, the machines, how to let, let the people virtually Imagine themselves they are inside the plant or inside the the department in order to repair the things. I think I think we are still in the learning curve. And as Mr. As Mr. Jamal said, really we will be very keen or or happy to to have a system or or something a technology can shorten the gap of having the technical. I know the internship. And from our side, we stop all the internship students to, inter to come to Alba. Not because we, we are not willing to offer them the training, but we are taking, we are, we are uh, uh, precautions of their safety. Because once they come, maybe they will be infected and uh, it, it will be not يعني, good for them and for good for us. That's why I think this uh, uh, topic or the university industry interface it is an important topic, should be addressed by everybody, and we should find a solution as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ali. Uh, we are recording all your suggestions, advice, and we are learning from your experience from manufacturing sector, one of the largest manufacturing 
industry in Bahrain and definitely we will incorporate your experience somewhere in our in our curriculums or maybe in our internship programs. So now I am inviting Mr. Uh, Arvind Benani. He is managing director of Productivity Middle East. So I want to give him a floor and I want him to share his experience post COVID-19, how his workplace changed because he is heading, heading the um, around 1,500, 2,000 people, how, how he is managing his team in this consultancy arena. So Mr. Arvind, uh, floor is yours. Uh, Mr. Arvind, please unmute. I'm sorry, Mr. Arvind, please. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Ali. Thank you, Dr. Gagan. And uh, definitely, uh, Mr. Jamal has already, you know, raised all the key questions or key things which, uh, you know, which we should be answering as the as the industry <clears throat> and university, you know, interactions. So we never thought. Uh, in reality, we never thought that, you know, that we can be functional and so productive when it comes to work from home. You know, suddenly we were all asked that, OK, there will be a lockdown. Certain certain uh, countries did a lockdown before, certain countries did a lockdown later. So gradually, you'll say more or less entire world went on lockdown. And then we realized that we re really need to start working from home we need to make sure that the clients actually you know see the value what is getting delivered and to our surprise that we were more or less you can say so equally productive and one of the most productive months what we had was the month of march and april you know where the productivity of people increased you know substantially the work from home proved that you know it can work and all the new technologies, people who are not the clients for us or the people or industry which were, we were not able to, you know, we were always thinking that, you know, there has to be a face to face meeting, in person meetings, and they were so receptive and the world suddenly changed. So the need of digital came onto forefront and everybody started talking about how to digital. Yes, definitely there is a, a big risk of cybersecurity which came into picture. And you would have seen that within the first month of the work from home, there were various, uh, you know, for one of the platforms, there was various advisory issues by various different governments. And those, you know, the cybersecurity issues were fixed by that particular platform. And again, people started using that same platform again. So the key things which came up during the entire, you know, work from home concept was basically, you know, Ms. Jamal, or Jamal used one particular word called work ethics. So it's really important, Dr. Gagan, Dr. Uh, you know, Abdullah and Professor Mansoor, that we need to cater to that work ethics part into our students from day one. You know, we need to ensure that people, yes, well, you know, there are there are enough. So we also we were also struggling at the, as an organization. Initially, we were also struggling that how do we look at? Yes, we believe that everybody's working that. How do we monitor that? So there used to be a lot of team calls happening on a regular basis where, you know, where we look at the progress of each and every assignment, each and every engagement which has been provided to all the team members. And that's where we came to know that, yes, things are actually running really well. People are able to work and people are able to support their families in these difficult times at the same point in time, you know, by sitting at home. You know, fathers were able to take care of the children along with mothers. So that's that's a, that's a something which is we are not thought about because eight hours in a day, nine hours in a day, we are always at work. You know, sometimes it stretches to 30, 20, 12, 14 hours. But here we were able to adjust our schedules in such a way that we are able to, you know, give time to our people, give our people, you know, and also to the family. So that became really, really important. And you know, behavioral things are really important, which has to be you know taught through within the uh, university curriculum. Soft skills are normally you know left to the uh, organizations to build in within the uh, within the uh, people, but it has to go into the university curriculums also, where you know the soft skills are given equal importance along with the technical skills. One very important thing, which I would like to say that. Uh, we have seen this happening across, you know, 
that building relationship, a personal rapport with your client or with your you know, colleague is really important. And it was very easy when we used to do it over you know, a face to face meeting. You go on the coffee, you you take the you talk to people on a regular basis, you discuss some problems, you know, you get some solutions, you brainstorm. However, these things had literally gone down. You know, in a virtual reality, you are living at, you know, living only within the within, I'll say within the four walls. You know, sometimes you are locked on to one particular seat for hours because you are sitting and holding various different meetings, various different client meetings, various different management meetings you are holding. So this was happening. So there, that's where you know we came up with solutions like you know there has to be some you know fun activities within the organization. So that also is really important. So Dr. Gagan, your problem of people sleeping or not sleeping will actually go off if you start doing some of the fun activities at the same time. You know instead of you know uh, you know blasting them with the technical details only. Yes, so, I agree. So these these kind of things became really important from a skill perspective. You know, the earlier things used to be there for a number of years. I know I remember that uh, when I started my career, I might not look that old, but uh, people used to learn typing. I remember learning typing on my own. So there used to be a typewriter uh, in a box kind of thing, which could have been carried. Sometimes it was very heavy. Sometimes they had smaller version also. And definitely my kids have never seen that. So those that typewriters used to be there for it was there for ages. My grandfather, my father, me, all of all of us seen. But now, from typewriter to a you know smartphone, we have gone in a space of 20 years, which is you know everything can be done on a smartphone. So technology changes every day. So few years back, we were learning about I'll say you know uh, robotics. So a uh, couple of years back, I was in US and we, I visited the uh, Tesla factory where we could not even locate a single employee on the factory floor. All were sitting in the control room and actually managing and mapping the entire activity, how it's being done by robots. So this was like uh, three years back, 2017. Now, people are saying robotics is more or less going towards, it's going out. It's now, you know, intelligent automation, where even bots will keep learning from their own mistakes. So things have really changed. So we really need to make sure that students are technology that technologically that advanced and able to you know gear up to the latest thing, latest thing. Now at this age again, I started you know uh, uh, Jamal mentioned that his grandson has been doing uh, coding, and uh, I actually realized that uh, even I have been I have been learning coding for last when I used my time you know for the uh, I'll say we used to go for three to four meetings on a daily basis. Sometimes I would actually drive down to Saudi Arabia to the mom to, for a meeting and come back to Bahrain. So it will take two hours of coming and you know uh, up and down. I'm say I started saving that time with the virtual. So I use my time to actually do the coding. So this is something which need to be built in within the students also. They need to bring that forward. You know that people have to make themselves technologically advanced and start working on themselves to rebuild the skills. Skills today need much more sharpening and rebuilding on a more regular basis than what used to used to be earlier. One of the key things which uh, uh, we talked about was internship. Internship, I'll say that uh, uh, we have recently, you know, started our or let's say restarted our uh, internship program. Only thing is, yes, we would like our interns to come to office, but for their safekeeping, for their you know benefit, we want them to be working from home or working from a remote location. Yes, it will not be same. As I said, you know, personal rapport development is important. You know, you need to have one to one meetings with your uh, mentors or somebody who's going to go go and hold your hands. You know, you need to have that one to one meeting sometimes. And you know, uh, the the benefit of having impromptu discussions or you know, unplanned discussions when you are sitting in an office, you have a problem, you just knock it to somebody's door and you know get your problems resolved will not be there. You need to be a bit more planned, but yes. The time savings, what we are having from the travel, what we are having from the number of coffees we used to drink, a number of breaks, number of chatting breaks we used to take, that is getting utilized. And only thing is earlier there might have been, you know, uh, not one to one mentor, 
one to many where five interns were uh, you know assigned to one particular mentor you know now what and it is it's become a bit easier because of the virtual real virtual world that we are able to do that as a one to one mentor and we plan for each and every intern that what are the key key things they need to you know uh, perform what are the time in which it needs to be performed so the virtual internship is actually you know we just kick started that particular program and we i think uh, you know we would be doing it successfully so that's something which has been you know we are experimenting on it and it's really important that we will work on it you know uh, going forward yes you know a regular contact with supervisor or a team via virtual methods like you know video calls emails instant messengers are something which we are making sure that you know uh, it is constant with the interns so that they at the end of the you know their uh, internship they come up with some something which is very fruitful one very important thing earlier it was always a pressure that you know it has to be done over a month of june or july or august you know you go at a stretch for four weeks for internship now it's good for the interns that if i have a problem and you know students are the smartest brains because they are young they can think which people do not think at all you know all if you look at all the new entrepreneurships uh, you know new things just come the all the innovators are pretty young so what and as an organization might not have a trouble in a particular week or during a particular month of july why because all interns come in the month of july july and august you know an organization might not have it and that's the better part that's the benefit from this virtual world that internship can be broken into 40 hours for let's say instead of one month it can be four different weeks in four different months so you know it, and it gives a better platform for the interns to do some real time problem solving with the with the organization where they are doing interning upon they can go on multiple internship you know on a shorter duration and do that so i would like to conclude that yes uh, pandemic has played a really you know uh, i'll say overall in, uh, negative impact on the economy but it has really opened up our eyes that what as humans we can achieve without even you know uh, moving from our chairs so yes definitely from the manufacturing sector and all this there has to be certain things which needs to be rebuilt automation needs to be done but yes we will walk towards it thank you very much and i'll be very happy to answer any questions what you may what whatever any of the panelists or any you know uh, organizers will have thank you very much mr arvind for your valuable thoughts from service sector and we really appreciate your your experiences how you share your experiences and uh, definitely we look forward uh, for some more clarifications we have the question answer box open so many of the participants are uh, raising the questions i am collecting those and i am trying to make it in groups so that we can address those questions for the participants and for your information our participants are uh, from uh, bahrain from dcc from uk from india from other countries so we have the participant from uh, all, all over the world actually you can say now uh, i am inviting mr dean rowan now i am inviting mr dean rowan and he is uh, right now working with ernst and young and he is mainly responsible for uh, board training but at the same time he is uh, carrying many other hats like he is holding some positions some senior positions in professional bodies as well he is looking after even the prmi operations in middle east he is a regional director in prmi society he is looking after even international compliance association he is also a member of australian company directors so i am sure he has a different different view altogether from other panelists he is coming from different background he is coming from risk management and compliance background so i am giving floor to mr dean rowan he will share his experience now from risk management compliance anti money laundering or banking sector investment sector so i am sure our participant will be benefited by his thoughts so mr dean rowan i welcome you thank you um i would like to 
take a somewhat different perspective and throw a challenge to everybody who's listening, and that is not only the higher education, a challenge to both students and to employees and more so to organizations. So let me just take a step back and, and outline my views on what the purpose of higher education is all about. Fundamentally, it's about preparing students for sustainable employment. And of course, that paradigm shift has moved quite dramatically with COVID. It's about how do we prepare students for active citizenship? And that comes back to the morals and ethics that you know, was just being spoken about. How do you actually, um, how do universities create personal development for creating a broad advanced knowledge base that's appropriate to the use for the industry? And of course, how do you stimulate research and innovation? So that's, in my view, the purposes of higher education. For students and employees, I would challenge you to think about what are the skills that you need to develop for the new environment? How do you actually differentiate yourself digitally from other uh, colleagues and students and individuals? How do you actually demonstrate productivity? And most importantly, how do you actually get human engagement in a digital world? Because as we move down and everything becomes more digital, if we lose that human element, we lose that interconnectedness that binds us together, that brings not only our humanity, but allows us to work together as capable um, individuals and, and human beings. And of course, for organizations, as has been managed, we need to be able to identify how we manage people, how do we manage productivity, what are the metrics we use? And of course, I'll throw a challenge out there how do we deal with mental health? And that is enough downtime because the last thing we want to do, and I'm 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 a, a, a criminal of this, I'm working longer and harder with almost zero downtime than I've worked in a very long time. So those are the challenges that I'll throw to um, every component of this. So let's just take a quick step back. I mean, obviously Zoom and WebEx, you know, have thrown a university of lifetime. But lecturers in, in general, and I've reached out to quite a few, are actually struggling with the same depth of engagement with students that they have in the classroom. And you know, globally, universities are seeing a decline in enrollments um, in campus-based programs and a parallel increase in their online courses. COVID, of course, you know, uh, is yesterday's disruptor, can now be today's lifeguard. So as painful and as stressful as today's time is, it actually gives us a rebirth of our educational systems. But fundamentally, it's actually really important that this whole pandemic has underscored how indispensable it is for our populations to be digitally literate, how to function and progress in a world where social distancing, greater digitization of services, and a more digitally centered orientation has now become the digital norm. So, it's forcing our universities and our organizations to look at how do we deliver education, what the role of college and universities actually become, and of course, a challenge for all of us, irrespective of whether or not we're a student in our first education um, or in postgraduates, we need to um, fire that lifelong desire for lifelong learning, and how do we draw, draw the distinction between traditional and non-traditional learning mechanisms? So if we look at higher education and a disruption, obviously both domestically and internationally, universities have been way, way disrupted. And, you know, and, and major organizations like McKinsey's and others have saying that this disruption could range between one, one year to five years. Forecasts are suggesting globally that there could be a decrease in enrollment anywhere between 15 to 25%, but it depends. There are massive opportunities that I think for extending online and post and outside geographical areas that I talk about a little bit more in just a second. So we need to understand what the new model, the business model is once COVID um, has passed. We need to understand how students are either satisfied or not with their distant learning experience. And of course, we need to understand the financial perspective because in this current financial economic climate, many students may not be in a financial position to actually enroll. And of course, we need to understand the motivational and productivity issues from both an employee's and an, uh, an employer's perspective. So I think that we're going to see quite a rapid change. We're going to see, regretfully, you know, many universities and colleges may actually be forced to close. Um, and so part of the business models is how do universities 
actually collaborate and merge together with other institutions to provide cost effective and appropriate uh, uh, programs uh, rather than actually competing. So I think that there is a massive um, opportunity and we can talk about that in just a little second. So from my perspective, I think it's around how do universities now look at their strategic positioning? How do you actually uh, transition from a, uh, a physical based um, program delivery to a uh, online program where there is a, the ability to uh, offer uh, programs on an ongoing perspective? How do you actually have year round recruitment activities and allow applicants the greater flexibility in both college and university? So it's around collaboration and competition. And we can talk about that in just a little bit more in just a second, but I just thought I'd tag that as, a, as, a, as an over, overall introduction. Thank you very much, Mr. Dean. Uh, we appreciate your thoughts and definitely it, uh, your perspective was very different from other people's perspective because your background is very different from other panelists. So this was the reason we invited you so that we can have a variety of the thoughts, variety of the insights, variety of the experience from different segment of the society, different segment of the industry. So uh, definitely I'm receiving many, many questions for our panelists in our question answer box. So definitely I will encourage my participant of this webinar to, to write their questions in this question answer session, question answer box. And now I'm moving to the next panelist, Mr. Ali Abbas Radhi. Uh, Mr. Ali Abbas Radhi, uh, I already discussed that he is a managing partner in Avil Accountant and Management Consultant Firm. And he is a former senior partner of BDO, BDO, uh, BDO Bahrain, Qatar and Oman. And he is uh, the holding the position of uh, chairman of Bahrain Accounting a Association. So definitely he may have different experience. He worked in this industry from last 25, 30 years. He is a chartered accountant by profession and he was the board uh, the the steering committee member in corporate governance board he is sitting on the board board in various companies listed companies in gcc so i'm sure he will have his own experience so he may share some different experience altogether so i am giving floor to mr ali uh, mr abbas radhi so that he can share his experience and we will benefit all Sir, you are mute. Mr. Abbas, you are mute. Mr. Abbas, please. Uh, thank you everybody for this wonderful evening. In fact, uh, I shall start by thanking Victor Abdullah for all for his encouragement and support for these beneficial events at this very critical time of the human era, I can say, because no one is really, as Mr. Ali Bakali said, no one is really expecting how to get out of this situation. Anyway, I'm going to be more direct. Universities are all about human building and human capital building and making them ready for the work workplace. In fact, what my colleagues all said and concentrated on is how the human being can deal with a situation that never been expected over in, in the human history. We never seen a pandemic that will that closed everything and never expected to work away from home and not to have physical contact or face-to-face -face learning experiences and so on. Therefore, the theme of this webinar is what is 
the what does the university expect from the industry and what the industry expect from the university i'm going to be very direct universities teaching technology technology is a must to deal with the with the day to day uh, lifestyle whether we like it or not every one of us will have one or two iphone and will have ipad and so on so teaching technology and digital uh, is coming without saying but still mr jamal fakhro touch base on very important subject during the annual conference of the Indian Institute of Chartered Accountant. And today he again said that we need accountant to make the software, to write the software program for accounting matters, and we need engineers to write the uh, engineering matters. And Ali El Baqali said, we need a subject matter to deal with the industry requirement. Now, what I'm saying, I'm making it directly. The university will have to concentrate on the human element, on teaching the student and making them ready to be human being. This means what comes with the human being of a characteristics such as the integrity, self-motivated, uh, time management, and so on. We away from the technology. I will say the technical skills are coming with the human being from kindergarten all the way to university. People now learning with uh, with digital equipment. So the technical is the digital learning computer survey, performance monitoring tools, and all so on. But the most important thing is the soft skill. So one has to be soft disciplined, has to be self-motivated, has to be a reliance, has to be a confidence, and psychologically ready to work away from the office to stay home for eight hours, to put eight hours work without disruption in order to be able to say, yes, I'm working at home. In the past, Mr. Jamal said that we were gauging performance based on attendance and based on, and therefore we have, uh, we have attendance record in every office. And we are, as auditor, we are working on timesheet and uh, time management all the time. Now, when we are left alone to work from home, it is left to us. Are we really self-disciplined and have the time management to deliver the tax assigned to us on time or not? So a newcomer, to the industry has to have these skills. And it is the character building is the, are all these skills. Therefore, I had uh, prepared a couple of slides which are saying core employability skills. For an employer would like to see in the a student or in the you recruit some of these skills. So here, maybe share it with us. Share with us the slide I prepared. Say that we need a good person uh, presentation skills. We need somebody to be well organized and timekeeping. Uh, are we are we having the uh, Presentation. Mr. Abbas, you can show your presentation or you want my IT people I, to show I, so I okay. have to show it. 
to have can show these three slides. Okay. Uh, and I will conclude. Are you showing? Yes, uh, our IT people are showing this. Hello? Yes, yes, uh, he is working and you can carry on in the meantime. He is fixing so in, in one minute. He is coming. Dr. Abdullah uh, always asks me the question. What is expected from the university to be more interacted and more? Uh, more. Uh, in, in, a, in a way, what, what is he saying? How can the university service the, the job market? We are saying, I'm repeating myself, that the core employment skills will be good personal presentation, timekeeping and self-discipline, uh, teamwork, to be a way to deal with the technology and to work as a team like what we are now doing, we never thought that we will have this conference or this meeting on digital on a digital basis. Uh, of course, to stay in a alone in a lock room for eight hours, you need to be. You have to have a positive attitude, and you have to be able to do everything alone. Uh, if you are not technology capable. And if you are not technology alert, literate, you will not be able to continue and to go up with, the, with this world requirement. I think to conclude. No. Okay, to conclude. Uh, Mr. Mr. Abbas, so, uh, now your slides are ready. You can, you can. Present whatever. I will go I to slide six. We we are we are okay. That's the background we took. We passed the dogs and cat attitude. Only then will uh, understand what I'm talking about. Go to slide six, please. Slide six. What skills will be required for them to be employable? These are the core skills. We said the character building, which is integrity, professionalism, doing the right things, work ethics, and working independently. A slide uh, after that. Head. And this is the core employability skills. Good personnel. I'm repeating myself. I have read it all by heart. And uh, just go to the conclusion. The conclusion, the last slide. Just to conclude, I think universities has their work to, to deal with this pandemic and to learn from this situation by working on the other aspect other than the technology and other than the sciences is to work on building of the character and making ready their students to deal with the uh, with the with the technology and to deal with the unexpected and to expect the unexpected situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Abbas Radhi. Uh, definitely, many of the slides which you show is addressing the questions of our participants because in our QA 
section i am receiving many questions which are addressed by your slides itself so definitely we will discuss those skills needed in couple of minutes again and we will take the view of all the panelists and now i am inviting uh, mr robert brown he is a senior chartered accountant and he worked in big four for last 30 years almost and he has a variety of experience he worked in many organization in Afri africa europe america gcc and now he is based in uh, ksa saudi arabia and now he uh, we are expecting expecting from him that he he can share his experience of consulting maybe how the consulting firms are dealing and what kind of uh, skills set will be required by the graduate now in the changing atmosphere changing scenario after this covid 19 mm -hmm. now you, floor is given to mr robert brown um thanks kaka one one of the big challenges of being the last speaker is that i think all the points that i would have liked to have made have already been made but nonetheless i'll try and add some other perspectives now obviously the world was working towards digitization um and things like virtual working and all the rest now with the big shock from covid-19 that's been accelerated very rapidly and we've basically been our hand has been forced we've just had to adopt these things whether we like them or not now in terms of what we're looking for from a university now the first thing is it's a really sad reality that a lot of jobs are going to go away they probably are not going to be enough jobs available um for the students that are coming out of university so i think one of the things that the universities are going to have to work with industry in doing and i know dr dulla has had this on his agenda for a while is teaching students entrepreneurship skills how to innovate how to actually start their own businesses and i think that universities and business could work together in terms of incubating smaller businesses um i think that's the one thing now in terms of some specific skills that i think are going to be in demand i th i think um specifically business continuity management now companies have had business continuity plans and all the rest but i think that companies are going to place a lot more emphasis on bcm and you know they are going to need specific skills in that area and managing in a crisis is not not an easy thing it's not something that everybody can actually do so i think it would be a good topic for people for universities to actually teach now the other thing is that i think social science is going to become a skill that's more in demand i mean some of the previous speakers have actually alluded to things like mental health um people being disengaged from human contact things like that now i think that businesses apart from having human resources functions are going to want to employ people who are skilled in things like change management and things like coaching people to cope better with the isolation of working from home of not having contact frequently with their colleagues their clients and and their management and i i think there are there is going to be a need for a, a lot more dedicated resource in that area the other area i think is i mean obviously gaga and alluded to the fact that i'm not exactly young and i guess none of us are but probably are um but the, the one thing is upskilling let's say the more mature students to actually adopt some of the new technologies that are emerging i think we've all done pretty well so far but obviously once things start to settle down I think there are going to be a lot of new skills that are going to be needed and while guys emerging from university the undergraduates might be getting trained in these skills I think there's going to be a big demand for more mature students to actually be upskilled in using these areas so um I I I think that there there is going to be a significant role for um universities going forward but i think that the focus actually needs to change somewhat in terms of what students 
universities are actually producing, what their skills are, and how these are going to fit in with business. So I'm not going to um, go on any further because I think that um, a lot of really good points have been made and, you know, I, I think it would be probably good to allow time for people to actually ask questions and get responses to those. Thank you very much, Mr. Robert. Now I am uh, receiving many, many questions in the question answer box. And I have one question actually in, uh, not a question actually, uh, it is a some sort of a recommendation from very senior uh, education leader. Uh, Professor Bakker has suggested that we should uh, form a, some committee uh, with industry for internship. Our university should make a, some committee which will address the internship challenges which are mentioned by His Excellency Mr. Jamal Fakru as well. So we, uh, we are thankful to Professor Bakar. He gave a very good suggestion. Definitely we will work on it. And we have one other very interesting question. Now it is very close to my heart as well. Uh, one guy, his name is not appearing, but here he is asking very interesting question that accounting will take over taken over by artificial intelligence in the future how true is it so maybe i can ask this question to uh, his excellency jamal fakru he is the best person he can answer this question mr jamal fakru uh, your mic your mic is mute sir Sorry. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Gaga. Uh, uh, I will appreciate it if you just call me Jamal Fakhr without, without excellency. We are friends. We are friends. Uh, thank you. Me. Thank you very much, sir. I'm delighted so to, to be on this call. Uh, it's, uh, it's very simple. I mean, I mean, artificial intelligence is going to take lots of the professions. Accountancy would definitely be affected, especially the bookkeeping part of it, but you would still need some auditors to understand how to operate the, 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 the artificial intelligence programs. They will take over from engineering, they will take over from, edu from education, they will take over from medicine, I mean, many uh, from, 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 from law business. So artificial intelligence is going to be to make major change in, in the education system that, 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 you are, that, you are, uh, that you are providing. Therefore, I was saying at the very beginning, you would need to focus on IT, digitalization and technology to ensure that your students and, and, and your graduates will find the right jobs uh, which, will, which will cater for their future in the future. We cannot, we cannot teach them in the same way, but we can teach them some curriculum which are, well, which are accountancy or law or business or whatever it is, with more of technology and how to use technology into that into that business. Jamal, uh, now we have the similar questions, but it is not addressed to the industry actually. It is addressed to education sector. And I know the background of Professor Mansoor. He's the right person among us who can answer my this question. It's a very short question, but very interesting question that how augmented virtual reality can help education. And I can truly, truly believe that the how fast our university uh, picked this technology for online teaching without any hassle, without any delay. So possibly Professor Mansoor, in only two minutes, just give give some highlights how this uh, virtual reality or augmented reality can help our education sector. You are back, your background is at IT, and you are sitting in a very high position in university system, higher education system. So I think you are the best person here. Uh, you are not uh, our panelist, but I, I am taking the privilege uh, as a moderator, and I am asking this question to you. Okay, thank you. I'm really uh, impressed and happy uh, to really hear all of these uh, beautiful uh, keynotes and, and suggestions. I've, I've made a large list of uh, points that have been raised by all these leading panelists, really. Uh, so 
I would have I would have preferred the question to go to, but since I, it was asked, uh, let me just tell you this. I think there is a misconception. You know, 40 years ago when I learned about artificial intelligence, and there was some presumptions how AI can be, and 40 years later, people are saying that AI is in action, that artificial intelligence is really in action. In reality, the word intelligence is really missing from this artificial intelligence. It is mostly integration of technologies. Technologies have slowly matured. We have integrated many technologies, communication technology, video technology, coding technology. A lot of technologies have matured, and now humanity have realized they can put these things together for a purpose, whatever that purpose is. It could be a robot to work in industry, it could be etc. Before I talk about virtual and augmented reality, you know, let me see it from an educationalist point of view. You know, being in education, we have a, a serious responsibility, and I think the panelists have alluded to it in many ways, that we have to graduate a real human being who cares about himself, about his society, about that he is armed with knowledge. He is he, he understand what ethics is. He understand what cooperation is. He understands what a project means. He understands what teamwork means. He, he he knows the commitment and deadlines of tomorrow he works. So everything we do in the university is towards graduating this person. Now recently I have been talking about the virtual professor and the virtual knowledge. Now, I think uh, uh, Mr. Jamal Fakhro mentioned at the beginning to Professor Abdullah, why do you want to go and build this huge campus? Because in reality, in 20, 30 years from now, I think campuses as we know them will diminish, will reduce, will shrink. They'll be represented by virtual campuses. I think the next immediate future is that I can see from the concept of smart books, the concept of smart books where we instead of the professor explaining what's in the book, literally the book will explain itself. So the knowledge is everywhere and will explain itself. And I gave an example a while back for the last 20 years. I don't want to over explain, but just I'll say this and I'll stop for the last 20 years. Uh, actually a bit more people were talking about semantic web. Semantic web means intelligent web. Until now, we don't have smart web. If you look at the research published about smart web in the last 20, 25 years, you'll be amazed. Millions of papers. Till today, we don't have smart web. Smart web means what? Now, if you go to Google and ask a question, Google will simply display for you sites that you have to go and choose the, the knowledge you want. So it's not smart at all. It's smart in choosing your keywords and identifying the key sites. But smart web means when I ask a question, the web itself is so intelligent, will go and formulate an answer for me from all the sources of knowledge it has, and it will project it for me, it will display it to me. So virtual reality, what we are teaching, how we are teaching now is virtual reality. Because you are there, you are actually teaching in the class, the students are there, you're delivering the lecture, it's virtual in the sense that you are not there physically, but everything else is the same. Augmented reality will be in, 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 in induced or will be injected with other things to actually make the idea a bit more, a bit more towards something. That's all. I don't want to over explain. Thank you. I think that's enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mansoor. Uh, now I have one question, very interesting question from uh, uh, Sheikh Duwaj Hamad Al Khalifa. He is asking this question, very interesting question. Now, because because of the social distancing, we are not able to meet many people and we are saving the time of travel. We are saving the time in other ways as well. We are not meeting physically. So how that time can be utilized for productive use. So this is quite interesting question. Can we give some kind of recommendation to uh, to our graduate, to our students, to our participants, how that time can be effectively used? Can I ask this question to Mr. Dean Rowan? Uh, 
uh, sir, please, your uh, sorry. mic is yes. muted. Yes, I'm sorry. That one caught me by surprise. Um, uh, look, I think it's, it's uh, you did catch me by surprise. I think it comes back to the balance of how do we actually um, balance our work, work, life um, opportunities. And as I made it in my earlier statement, I'm working longer and harder than I've ever had. And my mental downtime is is almost zero at the moment. So I think as we move into this environment, the last thing we need to be doing is answering emails at nine or 10 o'clock at night. We need to be ensuring that we segment um, our work life from our uh, from our personal life in whichever mechanism that may be. So you may be a morning person and want to spend time with your family, or you know you may want to work at four o'clock in the morning, as I know some colleagues do. So it's about productivity and um, how do you actually deliver the best best value to your organization? How do you generate the best return on your intellectual capabilities? And so we all need to work through, you know, how do we best deliver both to our own skill base and um, and to the organization's deliverables? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dean. Uh, now I am receiving one other interesting question. It is actually related to the framework that how how the framework of the new framework of industry university interface will emerge during this COVID-19 or after COVID-19. So now I am asking this question to Mr. Robert Brown. Okay, Mr. Well, Robert. well, I think it's quite important for us to first identify um, what the framework is. Now, in terms of, you know, looking at what industry expects, I mean, firstly, we do expect um, market aligned courses. So basically we expect um, universities to deliver um, skills that are essential to business. Now, um, obviously there's been a shift, which is very clear from this forum in what, what is relevant to business, what is more important to business right now. And obviously developing skilled manpower, which is pretty much the same thing. Obviously, a lot of people have, met, have mentioned that softer skills will be increasingly important. Adaptability will be increasingly important, things like that. Um, then the other thing is um, the businesses do expect universities to deliver solutions to important business problems. Now, um, obviously, we've got a lot of problems right now and I'm not going to start listing them, but obviously, there are a lot of companies that are financially dis distressed. There's a lot of unemployment, things like that. So I think that the research that universities do and that students do need to be laser focused on what the relevant issues are right now. Now, having said all of that, it is a two way street and it's important to say, well, what can business do for universities? What do universities do expect of business? Now, the one thing is um, funding and help with infrastructure. Now, obviously, funding for every university is going to be a challenge at the moment because universities are going to be going through a time of change. I mean, there's obviously the fact, as Dean alluded to, that attendance is probably going to drop and the whole delivery model is going to change. And that all requires investment. So, you know, where businesses can assist universities in terms of raising funds, in terms of supporting individual students, you know, I, I really would say that businesses who can should do. Um, the other thing is defining an equal partnership. And I think this forum is a very good example of partnership between industry and business. And, you know, I think ongoing dialogue is really important. And I think somebody early on suggested establishing a committee um, covering this topic, which I think is a great suggestion. Um, I think placements, internships, and I think Arvind mentioned the scenario of having sort of rolling one week internships for university students, which I think is also a really great idea. And Lastly, um, just being flexible in terms of what universities are going to deliver going forward, because if we think things have changed now, they are going to shift in future. Things are very dynamic at the moment, they're really fluid, and I think that, you know, 
universities should be really adaptable and not monitor and plan things by the year. I think things should be monitored and planned by the month, by the day. So I think, um, I hope that does address the question. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Robert. Uh, now I am receiving one other interesting question. It is related to contingency plan. It's a very interesting question. Nobody thought of COVID-19. Nobody thought of contingency plan, which which will address the the COVID-19 kind of scenarios. So this question I'm addressing to Mr. Abbas Radhi that how uh, how universities and business house industries they can make future contingency plan so that this kind of uh, emergency situation can be handled in future. So Mr. Abbas. Sir, you are mute. Uh, Mr. Abbas, you are mute. During my uh, talk, I said, one has to expect the unexpected. Therefore, during during the the normal course of business, one has to have uh, alternatives, and uh, we as auditors always recommended to climb to have a disaster recovery plan. It is not only disaster recovery plan, not only for the data and protecting the data and the digital data and uh, relevant information or client information, but it is this disaster recovery and an alternative and contingency plan has to be even to the supply chain, raw material, staff, uh, for industrial companies, as Mr. Al-Baqali said, that if one shift get affected with uh, the corona virus, then we, uh, he will have to change the whole shift. And some companies went into having a labor camp or a resident uh, employee for one week shift and alternative week for other shift. So contingency is an important factor has to be considered to ensure business and to the sustainability of your operation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abbas. Can, can I add uh, um, our real experience on this uh, question, actually? Yes, uh, I agree yes. With, yeah, I agree with Abbas. Yes, uh, there is, yeah, you have to expect unexpected in these uh, scenarios. But we are as an industry, we have our contingency plan attached with business continuity plan, attached with the sustainability plan, all these in one in one things. And we are practicing this by Mukidrid. But this COVID-19, it is, it is something unusual. While we are getting the same crisis, we are activating the normal contingency plan because we don't have contingency plan for the COVID. While we are executing the contingency plan, our normal contingency plan, we discovered there are some gaps to be closed in order to, to, to sustain the business. And these gaps actually work remotely we don't have a procedure or sops we have immediately draft a policy and the procedure to work remotely how to monitor the people work remotely for the shift we change our shift because normally we don't have complete shift out of, of business we create a policy and we put it in our contingency plan to work at 12 hours related to it is a difficult for the employee but in order to sustain the business, you have to to to, to do or to to take a difficult uh, decision sometimes. But 
as as Abbas said, yes, contingency plan should be reviewed continuously. We should not keep it on the shelf without practicing it because the time you need it, you need to execute it very fast and immediately. I discover or I know many companies, they have a proper contingency plan or contingency plan, but they keep it on shelf. If they have a disaster, it will be very difficult for them to execute without the training, without doing mock drill. Yeah. I think that is that is the key. A lot of uh, a lot of businesses they will have a generator, power generator standby, but at the time there was a power cut. These generators are def without without uh, energy or without gas or without uh, diesel to start it on time. So, and we have seen that a lot. Not to say about emergency rooms without uh, a standby generator to deal with the air conditioning problem or with a uh, briefing machine problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abbas, Mr. Ali, Ali Bakali. And uh, I am actually addressing the similar question to Mr. Dean Rowan as well. Now, in this new scenario, new COVID-19 scenario, what are the risks and opportunities for our universities or maybe for industry, for the students or for the graduates? If you can highlight briefly in next four minutes, five minutes. Uh, great, thank you. Look, with all the universities around the world now offering online and virtual training, there is both a massive opportunity and also a very substantial risk to both the Alalal University. So I think there are five core opportunities. Firstly, I think you need to have a differentiating value proposition. So w un under this new environment, what do you do better than other universities if everybody's coming online and offering you know, very similar sorts of things? Because you're now not bound by the geographical limitations which have historically underpinned all universities. So creating that value proposition in your vision is really quite critical, getting ahead of the events and reacting skillfully and strategically to the crisis. I think the second opportunity is creating a year-long academic program combining the best of both in-person and online learning. So how do you create a system whereby students, you know, in consultation with academic advisors, registrars can create a personalized education experience with course sequencing, sequencing and progressing. And so you could actually then create a year long academic program to reduce your attrition and transfer rates. Obviously that comes at a financial cost and obviously also there are issues in terms of um, ensuring you don't get burnout of your uh, your tutors, etc. This also opens up opportunity number three, which is how do you create a year long recruitment program for both domestic and international students? You could use agents to recruit worldwide because again, you're now not bound to the traditional and historic and geographical bounds. Fourthly, how do you create new business models and financing options? Because under this new environment, we need to think outside the box to how to uh, provide value proposition to students and affordability. And of course, lastly, how do we replace competition with collaboration and working with universities and build on each other's university strength to build programs that actually uh, cater to each university's skill base so that we can provide a cohesive and uh, coordinated approach to uh, academic learning to provide the best students for industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dean Robin. Uh, I'm sure this kind of points will be noted down by uh, by my team as well. So we will definitely incorporate those things and definitely we will try to explore new opportunities and try to convert the challenges into opportunities and mitigate the risk which is prevailing. And now I'm moving to the another area. Actually, uh, many of my colleagues, they are uh, very, very focused on the research and our university is one of the leading university in Middle East 
who is excelling in in research many of my colleagues are publishing papers with with different university professors and with industry and some of the papers even i wrote with mr robert brown so now my next question to uh, next question is related with collaborative research to to mr arvind benani that how uh, how university student faculty can collaborate with the industry for collaborative research and i am sure this question will be addressed to uh, mr arvind but if somebody else can uh, can want to answer they can also answer or maybe they can add on and i am sure this question will be very close to my heart uh, my heart as well as my colleagues heart my professor uh, like our dean professor alam is publishing so many papers so i am sure uh, the people like professor alam will be happy to get the answer of this question so i am giving floor to uh, mr arvind benani to to share his experience how we can collaborate on the research research part with the industry thank you dr garan i think uh, you know this particular pandemic has opened a lot of doors as dean rightly was mentioning just now that you know the in a nutshell if i have to you know put the, all the five opportunities listed down i'll say you can be a global university at local level you know so the pandemic has actually shown things that there are a lot of things which can be done you know even without you know uh, coming face to face without actually interacting directly in person so a lot of things which can be done that way so even going at a you know uh, tying up with not only the industries at a, a local level but tying up with industry with respective you know expertise at a global level is very much open you know one of the key things with uh, robert brought out was to identify the key challenges what is getting faced today to the industry and then work with the industry in order to achieve that as i said earlier also the best minds and the most innovative minds are the students you know they are the people who are most innovative who come up with always with new ideas and new you know uh, uh, i'll say uh, the entire so, uh, but when i was talking about the internship program what we are we just started it was actually defined and designed by one of the uh, proposed interns you know uh, so that please go on so that's one of the key things you know that we say that we have to work with the universities to actually identify the research activities and where to focus on and where to invest our people's future and because the key innovation is going to come from the universities and from you know look at the look at the uh, most of the uh, researchers uh, researches currently going on if you look at all the medical you know medicine uh, work going on it's happening at two different places pharmaceutical pharmaceutical companies and universities so that's the key example where i'll say that you know we need to collaborate together we need to come with a specific <laughs> plan device the entire thing and then go forward with the clinical research or whether it was a, a technical or non technical research uh, dr gagan i can i add to this a little bit if you <laughs> yes yes sir sure uh, uh, i think this is a very important uh part or question and i think this is really where we want the feedback from our uh, panelists i'll give you an example of uh, collaboration and i think maybe mr ali baqali can it concerns alba specifically in the 90s i had two students some one somebody was called zuhair and the other one was called hussein I had a, and they were only BSc students. They are not master students. And I took these students to Alba, to the electricity or the, the turbine place or the electrical. And we know Alba is a large generator of electricity. Power station, power station. The power station, the power station. And they had a, a little problem. And I'm talking about real collaborative where we can, we have to identify places and areas where we can collaborate. Uh, they had an issue with predicting failure with these turbines or whatever they are. They, were, they had an issue. They had an issue with the components, predicting the life of a component. 
We studied it, and I want to remind you, they were only BSc students and not master students. We worked on it. We, they developed the program, and I was really so happy that the manager at that time, after he saw what they developed, he gave him employment straight away. Now, that was a real achievement. There was a, a problem in industry where a faculty, a, 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 one of the doctors from university, and a couple of students looked at it, and I'm happy to tell you, I personally published two papers from it. One is in the Power magazine. You can go and look at it. It's called about component prediction failure. Uh, it's in the, it was published in the Power magazine. Now, I think, you know, uh, having these industry and commerce leaders, we need to find real, real ways of collaboration. How do we identify the challenges industry has and the areas they are having and they want to look into and they don't have the time. They are busy manufacturing. They are busy operating. They are busy planning. They don't have time and they don't employ real time researchers and if they do they cannot employ researchers in all fields now this is where universities come and this is where the west has really succeeded they have really succeeded they have managed to find a way a formula a model where they've actually this is an industry they have a problem or two they call a university or by personal contacts or they broadcast it or, or publish it or in their website and people compete to solve it this serves i'll tell you what it means Number one, it is corporate social responsibility for the organization. And I think large organizations require that. This is actually investing in the future graduates that you want to employ. This is uh, 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 making, may, presenting Bahrain as a research center because any paper we published has the Kingdom of Bahrain on it. And say in our case, Ali University. It serves many purposes, but I think over the years, we're not able to create that model. We're not able to identify the collaboration. And today is a, a step in the right direction with all these leaders. Let's identify and we'd like to hear from our you know, distinguished panelists. How do we approach it? Mm -hmm. Especially, I guess, what I'll say one last sentence. I've said it earlier. We have every year 100 master students doing dissertation and we have about 10 to 15 PhDs. I'll give you one particular example. We have a Master of Science in Engineering Management here running locally by the George Washington University. This is the leading international program in engineering management. Every year we have 30 students wanting to do research, a dissertation in an area in engineering and engineering management. Here where Alba, Bobco, all these KPMG can really help us and they can help themselves. Yeah. And I'm um, really projecting this to you to think of ways, and we are really, as Ahliya, we will do our best to cooperate. We will do whatever you think is appropriate to come and see you and discuss with you. Thank you. Gagan, I'd just like to add something or just give a, give a perspective. Now, I think that the one thing, you know, the one issue I have is I don't actually know what type of research Alia University is doing. So a practical suggestion would be to identify interested industry leaders and actually circulate um, the research proposals or the topics that are currently being researched, just so you can identify, let's say your sponsors within the business community, people to which the stuff will be relevant. Now, just one other caveat I'd like to add is, you know, everybody is probably going to be racing towards doing research associated with what's happened, what is happening with COVID-19. And I think the one thing we've got to realise is that, inshallah, we will be moving beyond that world. So we do also need to identify, well, we also need to kind of identify the fact that business needs are not just related to COVID-19. might be the topic of well, the year, maybe the century, but um, we are going to move beyond that. Can I add a uh, few things here in, in, in this uh, regards? Uh, I agree with uh, Professor Mansour. Yes, in the past, really, Alba and the other uh, major industry in Bahrain, they are accommodating uh, the research uh, 
uh, and there are many successful story. But unfortunately, we try for the last many years to coordinate with many universities in Bahrain to have this start again. But the problems, what we face, we discover, I and mean, this is not a general statement, but what we got actually from the university, it's, it's not the intent of doing a research. Just to waste the time of the our management to explain to them, blah, blah, blah. But unfortunately, at the end, there is no a positive result. I am I am keen to open this يعني, again to to have a research again, but our environment is not an easy environment. We have to consider a lot of things like a safety is very important, like Alba. The guy who will come to do a research, he need at least two weeks just to formalize himself with the safety precautions in Alba. Then later on, he had to, to come. And unfortunately, this we didn't see any from other universities or from other people to come with the seriousness. Or they should be left alone without monitoring from the university. This, if someone do a research, should be a two-way, three-way uh, communications. The researchers, the student, the university, and the company. But what we saw for the last many يعني, years, if we have uh, a researcher come here just for a certain period and he go away, even if nobody share with us the outcome of the research. This is this is my point. Just I want to highlight it. Can I can I say uh, something here, uh, Doctor Vgaga? I want just to yes, also yes, to, comment, Jamal, sure. to comment on uh, on Doctor Mansour uh, uh, request on collaboration between the private sector. I think I think we uh, this is unfortunate that over the years the relationship between the universities and especially the University of Bahrain, which used to be the which is the largest really university on the island, and the private sector have been gradually uh, uh, producing. And I think I think Dr. Mansour could easily uh, ask his, his deputy who is responsible for the relationship with the industry to start talking to the industry, identify 10, 15 companies that they believe they, they are sizable enough who can help them and to approach them. And, uh, and, and as Dr. Bakker earlier said, about having a, a, a committee between the private sector and the university on uh, on uh, on the future of education we can also have a similar group to discuss how we can collaborate and cooperate between between the researchers between your students who are doing master degrees phds how we can help them in doing that i mean i mean ali have had have, have his own limitation but we don't have the same limitation and I'm sure Ali, with his limitation, uh, you know, after some time, they will find this is to be a norm. They will appoint somebody at, at Alba who will educate these guys, train them, and so on and so on. So my point, unless you guys come and talk to us to tell us these are our needs. It is exactly, Dr. Gaga, when we come to see you to talk about our needs of students to work with us, we come to talk to you, we get them in our offices, we, we meet them, and so on and so on. It is exactly the same. I think if you start calling for these large offices, large companies, let's have a debate on that and how to see how we can help you with that. Maybe we cannot, and maybe others could. So I think it just require require two way communication, not more than that. Yeah, thank you. Can I can I comment, uh, uh, Dr. Gagan? Yes, Professor. Yeah, I will. Let, yeah, I, I, I really listen to uh, uh, Mr. Ali uh, Bagali, and I'm very, very happy to hear the comment of uh, also Jamal Fakhro. Uh, and of course, uh, started with, with Mansoor. And I think what uh, what Jamal Fakhro have said is exactly what we should do. And I'm I'm sure. Mansoor knows that, and we've already requested our people, and we called it even research, commercialization of research, and all that. This is a very, very, very important that we as universities go and visit the industry, and I'm sure 
they have problems which needed to be tackled by us and we are sure also that we can tackle them you know as long as we are keen and the idea is not to be just to have committees and have names and have this no the idea to produce two or three examples of collaboration between us and the industry and that's the result and if we can do it i mean we have nearly 20 phds every year doing work 10 or 15 or 20. we have about 100 master students and we have nearly 200 research the last year we call it the capstone research these all can be real industry problems you know and it's always good to have industry problems and when we started our phd program 20 years ago or 18 years ago i was asked why would you want to start phd so soon i said because although university is is new but we are not new the industry is not new there is always the problems and without really so i do agree jamal thank you very much and ali thank you very much I think, yes, it's our side that we should go and solicit and look at the uh, industry and tell them, give us a suggestion or maybe we give them a suggestion. Uh, so I assure you, Jamal, that from next week, inshallah, Mansoor, we should really, we started this, if you remember, two years ago. We went and we visited six or seven places. We went to Alba. We want to petrochemicals, we want to Babco, and we met with them and we took with us the Dean of Research and this, but maybe we should really be uh, more frequently contacting the industry, ask them what they need really. I, re I was really happy to hear uh, Jamal comments, uh, you know, because you know, uh, we cannot live as universities on fees of student only. We need to collaborate with industry. And I always tell my students, you know, that, my, that uh, Windows was the idea of a Bahraini. Windows was the idea of a Bahraini. A Bahraini started working in the early 70s in Mantik and had a program called Nafida and then this Navida became Windows. Trillions of dinars or dollars came. The idea from a small young Bahraini. So why can't we try really? And there is many things, especially when it comes to the finance, the accounting, the auditing, the maybe it's more difficult with the with the with Alba, but but still there is other things, you know, and I'm sure our researchers would be able to go and, and spend an alba two to three weeks to make sure they are re ready for the and spend another two months there why not you know i think i think this is it's time that we should start that so i really thank jamal fakhru and i thank ali for their remarks and uh, i think we should start thank you very much thank you i think just if just one a couple of words I think from what we hear and what we understand, I think we need to work out a relationship formula. We need to decide if there is, as Mr. Ali raised some concern about, you know, that they, they, the, the results of the research they don't get or, you know, there is no real follow up. I think these are the issues which caused us not to progress. And the, the ideas Mr. Jamal Fakhro has presented uh, and these, I think we need to sit down and maybe what we'll do is we already set up a team as Professor Abdullah mentioned, but maybe we'll go back and this is the whole idea of this meeting today is really identifying where we have gone wrong and what how can we proceed because I always believe in a formula in Arabic, you know, you, you have to open doors to ideas. So I suggest and what, what we're going to do, we're going to have an inward look, we're going to revisit how we've been acting. We would like maybe conduct visits. We will start by, uh, if, with your permission, with Alba and uh, uh, KPMGs to start with, uh, and then we'll move. And we need to 
and I always believe, you know, a, a good project is a working project. Even if we start with one and it succeed and we put our energy into it instead of having so many and then all failing, you start with one and we will take it from there. So thank you. I really appreciate your understanding and your support. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gagan, we are very close to time, so you yes, might want thank you. to. Thank you, Professor uh, Abdullah, Professor Mansoor, uh, Mr. Ali, uh, Mr. Jamal Fakru, Mr. Rob. Uh, uh, Mr. Abbas, time is running short, and we have a small two questions, very interesting two questions, and we can, uh, I think we can answer those questions. And it is very interesting. I'm sure all the panelists will be happy to listen to those questions. I have uh, one question from uh, um, my own colleague, Dr. Litty. Uh, will industry accept online education, online degree? Suppose somebody is getting the online degree. Will um, the organization like Alba or KPMG will accept this kind of graduates? in future because now we are going in that direction so it's a very yes or no kind of question uh, maybe uh, it's a tricky question as a as a employer you can answer but uh, i'm addressing this question to mr ali and mr jamal fakro yeah if, if i can answer it you know i mean president trump uh, the other day so i have signed something that said skills more important than even degrees <laughs> so so so, yes. so they're going to check the skills you know they're going to check how 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 they've learned but it's not them well our legislation here and hac and all this will accept that i think they should be proactive and they should really move and be brave enough and take calculated risk to make Bahrain, you know, move rather than we trail behind the others when the others have accepted everything, then we accept. So uh, I think it's a very, very important that our legislators here uh, be brave and we also as universities should convince them that we are worth doing that and that they should trust us and we should really be happy. I've just said before, Bahrain is very, very lucky because, you know, you know, we have the infrastructure, we have the ICT in the country. So let's move really. So uh, that's it. I have uh, I am addressing this question to Mr. Ali and Mr. Jamal. <laughs> very quickly, we have to wrap up. Okay. And anyway, from my side, I think there is no right or wrong answer for, for these questions. But I can tell you that for soft skills, maybe it's acceptable. But for yes. technical and hard works, definitely you need someone to practice in order to gain the skills. You cannot bring someone, he, he learn the, the, the skills only virtually and let him to work on the machine, which required a lot of precaution and safety, other things. It's very difficult for the time being, but maybe in the future with you the technology, know. maybe everything will be changed. Well, if we have if we have virtual machines, this could happen. This could work. Yeah, so we we'll have to wait to technology to see how this technology can help us having a training on the job on. We call it on the job training, but virtual on the job training. And this is why my this is what I started this this uh, today. The, this, this afternoon, I said, I am facing a problem today with my internship. How can I get my, the intern into my office? How could they learn on the job? We really we don't have the tools for them to learn on the job while they are outside the office. So this is, a, a, again, a good question. Goes back to Dr. Becker's uh, 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 earlier uh, comment that we need really to get together see how we can help our, our students, how we can help our community, and I'm sure we have enough brains to come up with some good ideas. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jamal. Uh, just Mr. I want Gagan, to add yes. one more thing which is missed here, and even uh, KPMD has some uh, virtual learning platforms which can also help our student to develop some soft skills 
so possibly we can also work on that uh, with you as well you and can, uh, one more you last can, question yes you want to add something mr jamal you can access to all our virtual training don't worry okay sir thank you thank you very much Abbas. and now i am taking the last question and it is actually i clubbed the discussion from, from I, i am giving you a chance as well, mr abbas just just uh, just a minute okay. let me ask, ask this last question and i am receiving one question from uh, this uh, uh, karan gulati acca from uk and one question from india it is manav agarwal he is from india and he, they are asking similar questions actually now during this covid 19 scenario uh, we are promoting that uh, employee should work from home so as a accounting guys we understand that if we are far away from office there is a more chance of fraudulent activities i am sure many of the big four all the big offices all the accounting firms they have some security protocols so can can mr jamal can highlight uh, how we can address this issue how this fraudulent activities can be mitigated if we are working from home mr jamal well, i mean i mean this is very simple uh, question and very simple answer Technology, I mean, I mean, I mean, risk management. We have referred to that. Uh, a, a number of of protocols have been have been brought in on our on on our machine on our technology to protect the information used and transferred from one system to another. Uh, we will, uh, I'm sure, the profession will develop. Again, number of uh, of of a procedures, number of protocols to prevent the fraudulency of the of information or of, of money uh, within 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 each company. So we should not be worried on that because we see every day there are a new a new uh, a new uh, measurement are taken. So what the, the most important thing is that we need to invest into that technology, have the money, have the power, have the guard. To ensure that we are going full time and full speed on technology and not to go halfway. Halfway would never take us anywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jamal. Now we already exceeded the time. It was a two hours plan, and now we are already exceeded the time. So I just want to conclude and I just want to thank everyone. And I just want to give opportunity to Professor Abdullah to give a small vote of thanks to everyone and then we will conclude the session uh okay did you give abbas the chance to talk yes yes right. sure sure you can okay okay otherwise uh, you know we could have problem you know no 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 it is just something i want to clarify i just want to say in I this three time, you know. in this three will be will be ready and will meet the university halfway if there is a sensible project that's worth uh, supporting. And um, this is the this is what I was going to say. As far as the virtual education and the degree, virtual degree or online degree will be acceptable or not, the legislation in Bahrain is still not uh, ready to put the, the framework to accept such degree. However, the COVID-19 forced this situation, and I think whether we like it or not, such method of teaching and delivery will be forced on everyone, as a lot of universities has already have already started to announce that their two years, the next two years will be only virtual rather than in a class teaching. That's what I was going to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shukran Abbas. Uh, I thank would you. like thank to you, really, uh, thank, uh, take this opportunity, you know, I to thank you very much. I really, you know, learned a lot and I, I enjoyed it because having all these different uh, from really leaders of industry, you know, uh, benefit Ahliya University a lot, really. And I think the the latest ideas, you know, that, that we should be closer to industry. We should really uh, 
يعني forget the old time of Ivory Towers University. Be very close to the problems of industry. And for this reason, I assure you, you know, we will take the recommendation from today. We will work immediately in it. And I hope next week or the week after, whether it's online or a short visit to Alba, to KPMG, and probably to others, you know, should should really start because we are very, very eager to have uh, industry universities collaboration. We've been always talking about it. Maybe sometimes we need a shake to make us move. Yes, and yes, I think COVID-19 have done that job. And <laughs> so thank you indeed, all of you. We've learned a lot. I enjoyed really two hours and uh, I hope that uh, we start uh, uh, يعني, doing it immediately. Thank you indeed. Thank you, Pro Dr. Thank Gagan, you. for this very, very interesting, really, forum. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you. I do not want to mention names because uh, six of you are, you, are, say this. you, you know, say this. and and you know, uh, we we'll, let's let's see you, inshallah, very soon. And I hope that this COVID-19 يعني على الأقل is in us, you know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank indeed. you. Shukran. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, you. Mr. Dean Rowan, Mr. Robert, Mr. Ali Bakali, Mr. Abbas Radhi, and uh, Mr. Jamal Fakro, and my management who gave this opportunity to to share the views, exchange the views. And uh, even I, I come to know uh, Protivity is also very eager to, to work with our university in, in terms of uh, collaborative research. So thank you, Mr. Arvin. Thank you very much. So we are concluding now this webinar. So thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Good evening, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you